Hello everyone, so thank you very much for sticking around this long. Uh, my name is uh, Luca Mustafa, um, so I'm a PhD student at UCL in London, but I run an open hardware development lab in Slovenia, that's um, quite a bit eastern in Europe, um, and currently a Shuttleworth Foundation Fellow, which allows me to do this great open source stuff and really explore how to be open and how to create open hardware um, and see how it actually works in the world. So um, how and what I'm doing is currently split between three organizations and a number of projects. Uh, so I'm running a nonprofit research and development lab. Um, and as a part of that, we're also exploring how to actually manufacture all the open hardware we produce through a company. And we run a fab lab um, in partnership with Creator Lab, where public can engage with all the systems. So um, just briefly, um, I work on about four plus projects at the moment. Uh, the key one being Kuruza, about which I'll tell a bit more in the next slide, and Good Enough CNC, which is the topic of today's presentation, as well as a network deployment platform and a Symbio Lab, which is an open hardware bio lab where we do also 3D printing uh, with some biomaterials and things like that. So my core perspective of the past four years was a project called Kuruza, which is an open source, open hardware wireless optical communication system. Now I know this doesn't tell you much, so um, it's really a wireless optical communication system which one would use in a city um, where radio spectrum is congested, so Wi-Fi doesn't give you very high throughput, and we know how difficult it is to actually lay a cable between some buildings uh, if you want to achieve that uh, personally or as a small organization. So about four years ago, um, I've started exploring how we can use open hardware and all quite a lot of available parts on the market to create a communication system like this. So today it looks like this, um, a very small box uh, which has all the parts inside, um, mainly an SFP module which is what you would find in a fiber optic network plus a lot of open hardware. So uh, just to clear up the application, uh, it's to connect buildings with pretty much lasers um, so we can get one or 10 gigabits across the road in the cheapest and simplest fashion possible. Um, so the whole development process uh, went on for quite a few years uh, with a lot of iterations and different kinds of um, prototypes. Um, on the slide you can see the two versions which we have at the moment and they kind of cultivated the answer how we should, at least in our case, look at open hardware. So you can see the 3D printable version, um, nicely in green, so it's very clear that it's printed, um, which is what we call a research and development platform. Um, you can very easily change all the 3D printed uh, parts and retweak the design to whatever you might be doing. And in open hardware, I believe this is very significant because we need to design the open hardware experience for our user as we wish to use it. So um, for if we look at it generally, hobby projects, it's nice just to put everything online. You put it on GitHub, Instructables, or whichever other way. But if we are looking for a bit higher adoption rate, we need to figure out what will the, be the main use case. Otherwise, we might be spending a lot of time preparing, let's say, one kind of documentation without actually being used later on. So uh, with the three printable design, we learned uh, that in previous versions, we had the unit was a bit like this tall. It was mostly 3D printed in like the several pieces that bolted together. And the biggest problem in that case was actually, you cannot easily modify that because you need to change a large 3D printed structure and reprint it again. So over iterations, we came to a final solution um, copied from the 3D printers more or less where we use some stainless steel rods as a common interface and you just stack different things um, in the unit and then you can easily just say replace the top part, the middle part, the bottom part or whichever thing like that. Um, and this makes it very very accessible even for people who've never done the 3D printed design before um, they can change something in an hour whereas the whole big part takes quite a long while. Um, but unfortunately, this is not a large scale uh, use case, how most people will interact with our designs. It's, it's really research and development. Whereas most users want just a finished product. So uh, over the 
course of the past year, uh, I've been exploring how do we use very common elements to build the final product, which you can see the other unit nicely uh, compact and ready for scale manufacturing. It's still open source, but the intent of the design is for total ownership of the product so we can tweak it and modify it for your use cases, not necessarily really change small features and be empowered to just play around with the design because the other one is much more suitable for that. However, in the whole process of development, um, we lacked some tools and decided to maybe sidestep a bit and investigate that field as well. So the main question I asked myself and my team is, what is good enough for you? This is, seems very simple at first, but it is most difficult to answer it. Um, because generally how we go about things is, we will buy the best machine for the money we have. So we'll just buy the best possible thing which we can afford, which in some cases turns out great, but in quite a lot of cases it is actually we spend a lot of money and then we're using it for a very basic use case and we might not need to spend that much money. So from my perspective, good enough is a feature of the device which actually enables you to do what you need, not much more for the simplest or most affordable possible way. So we have a few key guidelines around this, which is really to empower individuals and communities around the world to do this. Um, this is not Europe or US centered, uh, so we really look also at the other countries and how we can build something over there. Um, the key goal is to actually empower people to build the machine itself in the simplest, simplest, simplest possible form, to fix it, hack it, and make things with it, um, if possible, locally. So the guideline we can design for ourselves uh, to go forward with this is how to make things effectively open. So really actively planning how people can use it and in the most time efficient manner come to an operational result. Um, it needs to be affordable because then we can empower the greatest amount of people. Um, and also by the, having a module design, we can have the whole ecosystem later on, how these things develop. Now if you think um, about a number of businesses that can potentially start from open hardware and distributed production, um, you will generally come to a point where someone will ask you, well, what's your initial investment to buy this expensive proprietary machine to move forward? Well, I believe the answer might lie actually in getting the good enough CNC machine or just a good enough machine in whatever sort uh, which allows you to start moving forward but without spending a lot of money and effort before you actually start having some volume and turn around. So not really going to depth before you actually need to do so. Um, we've looked at the interaction of people with the open source and how do I, they actually go about it. So here on your right side, you can see that on top we can start from open source hardware uh, documentation. So this can either be source files, source files plus uh, build instructions or whichever way you want to look at it. And we generally have two paths people will follow. There's a reasonably small amount of people who are after the process, uh, who enjoy building things. Um, I believe quite uh, many of you here are the ones in this category and really like going to really do all the things. But if you sum up all the time, energy and money you spent doing it, uh, following the rightmost column, uh, you will see um, that it might be the, it might not be the most efficient way. So we started exploring the two options. What happens if we actually provide people with a kit, uh, w which may not con actually have everything inside, but really speeds up the process. So um, I'll show you in a moment what we actually constructed. But the big question for a bit larger machines is, how do we get them around the world in the most effective manner? For 3D printers, it's reasonably easy because you can fit them in a box, but anything heavier incurs a lot of uh, shipping charges. So uh, we've created something called Good Enough CNC. Um, 
with the key point being on the left, uh, the hybrid machine, which we believe is one of the simplest possible constructions of a CNC machine, purely out of very standard elements. And the three key components are just square steel tubing, um, bolts, and roller skate bearings. Um, plus, then you add some motors and control electronics to achieve that. So just jumping back um, a slide, you can see if you want to ship a machine, which is, let's say, a meter by two meters or whichever size you want to make it uh, around the world, this is not super efficient. So if we enable people by having a very tightly packed suitcase of things, um, and they can source components anywhere in the world, in any country, which are big and heavy, they can very efficiently build the end result, the machine, with the minimum amount of time, uh, if that is their preferred way of building them. So uh, with good enough CNC, we explored a few use cases, one being the plasma cutter, which is very efficient uh, when you want to build larger structures um, or self-replicate the machine itself. So uh, in this case, you see just a repetitive operation of um, cutting a trolley for a similar kind of machine. Um, if we take a closer look at the construction here, you can see that all the tubes are just st standard square tubes, um, which you can actually build the machine only with a drill press and an angle grinder. That meaning that you don't need any prior equipment to do so. Um, or you can put a different tool head on it and convert it into a mill within possibly 10 minutes. Um, now, a bit more on the technical details. Um, we had to innovate also on the control system, as we found that a lot of people have problems with wiring the machine, um, and especially when you have a plasma torch on it or something higher voltage, higher current, you get a lot of noise. So we've came up with a system we call Toslink CNC, where we actually place the motor driver um, and a small receiver board on the stepper motor itself, as you can see here on the Z-axis, so the white box strapped to the motor there. And to every motor, we just run a piece of Toslink fiber. So this is like a TV audio uh, fiber, which is very, very cheap these days, and DC power. Um, with that, we come up with a very, very robust solution, which does not break in any horrible environment you might be using this. Um, so we've also, for the needs of Kuruza system, started looking at 3D printers. Um, and this story started about four years ago uh, and have now gone through two iterations and built something where we print ABS all day long pretty much on the machines um, that are kind of robust for our use case. But also we were very careful on using completely standard parts. Uh, so except the enclosure and a few 3D printed uh, items, it's all very, very standard and you can buy it from multiple vendors. That being one of the key requirements if you want a lot of people to replicate this in a lot of different countries and a lot of different supply chains. So how does this look in practice? Well, uh, we collaborated with uh, the community organization, um, unfortunately some text escaped, um, in Nepal, uh, where they received uh, just uh, after the earthquake um, a suitcase with all the essential parts but the long tubes and all the heavy things, they found locally without a problem. And this was actually the key trick uh, in this process because it is super difficult to get a, a crate sized machine over there. And this is now one of the early uh, plasma cutters in the environment. So you can see some experiments here just with a pen drawing um, on paper in this case and the finished uh, result. So we were happy to see that something like this does actually work in practice that without our involvement, people are able to reproduce it. Um, so either they could start from scratch or receive a small box, pretty much a starter kit, and just fill it up with the heavy and pretty much cheap parts uh, they find local. So um, we are currently interested in exploring this in a bit different way, um, creating a whole pipeline from open designs um, to manufacturing solutions so we empower the largest amount of people actually going from an idea or a project to the end result. Um, and think about good enough machining is actually, we don't have the highest spec machines and a lot of designs today assume that parts will operate or will be produced in its perfect state as we draw them. 
So if we draw something in CAD, it, it, we will actually have the same replica. But if we start thinking a bit smarter about the designs, we can drop down the requirements uh, we need for the machine and thus make it much, much more effective for everyone to reproduce. So uh, we've been looking at a few potential things to produce um, and have done quite some tests. Anything from 3D printing a uh, glia stethoscope um, by Tarek Lubani, um, which is also being 3D printed and used uh, with, uh, I believe, some Prusa uh, printers uh, in Gaza Strip at the moment, um, or say, Acre uh, Urban Gardening Kits, um, or possibly other things. Um, and just to show a nice collaboration with another open source project, uh, Metaki Tech uh, from London Zoo, um, with these machines, we were able to first prototype and actually produce some nice enclosures for tracking green turtles um, on the island of Principe. Um, and this really starts showing the power of open from electronics to mechanics and producing things very efficiently where we can save, let's say, one species uh, in the world, if not more. Um, so I would like to invite you to find more details um, on the website about all of this. Uh, if you are uh, local here, you're also invited on Monday uh, at 7 a.m. to Control H Backspace, uh, where I will have another presentation and you can ask a lot of uh, questions on the topic as well. So thank you very much.